So, hello everybody. Thanks you all for coming. Uh, this is the first presentation of this semester, also this year, uh, for the new phases. Uh, we are going to first have a presentation by Mateo, uh, like uh, 25 minutes, 30. And then we are having a, like an open discussion at the end. And maybe if you want, we, uh, we are going to a bar later to continue the, the discussion. Um, Today's presenter, as I said, is Matteo. He studied engineering physics uh, in Torino, in Italy. Um, he's interested in the applications of quantum mechanics and also solid state physics. That's why he prepared the presentation about dilution refrigerators. Um, the paper uh, was done in collaboration between three research institutes. The first one, well, the, all of them are related to cryogenics, obviously. The first one does quantum research and also biological and medical research. Um, and the last one, it's in uh, Eindhoven, here in the Netherlands, which is where the, the whale um, is doing his work. Uh, so now I will leave the floor to, to Matteo. Okay, thank you, Mark, for the presentation. And uh, so let us uh, begin with the topic of uh, today, indeed, uh, dilution refrigerators. Before going uh, to the physics uh, of uh, this system, I think it's nice to have a little bit of an historical background. So, dilution refrigerators was uh, first proposed in 1950s by Hans London. For those who doesn't know him, Hans London was one of the pioneers in the development of the theory of supercomputing. For instance, him, along with his brother, is very famous for the true normal equation, which enables us to uh, describe microscopically the main features of superconductivity. Not obviously micros microscopically speaking, because for that we need PCS uh, theory. Uh, so it was core proposed in the 1950s, but then realized experimentally here in the Netherlands in 1964 at Leiden University. And the first commercial uh, device was uh, done by Oxford Instrument in 1966. And this company is still uh, one of the main that uh, produce uh, this kind of uh, devices uh, uh, nowadays. Uh, it is also worth uh, mentioning that thanks to this technology, two uh, Nobel Prizes for Physics were awarded 10 years one after the other. The first one in 1971 for the discovery of superfluidity, and the second one 10 years later for instance for the discovery of fractional quantum work. What always uh, struck me about uh, this uh, system is their temperature range of operation, which uh, spans between uh, 10 millikelvin uh, and 25 millikelvin. And the lowest temperature that was uh, achieved by dilution refrigerators, especially thanks to a specific kind of technology for uh, heat exchangers, which I'm going to talk later, was done by uh, uh, for second all entities uh, around 1.9 millikelvin. So very nice, we can get as low as this millikelvin, but why on earth would we need to do that? Well, uh, there are several reasons. For instance, we all know that quantum mechanic uh, effects, and in specific, some of them only take place at very low temperature. Let's think about superconductivity, superfluidity, the uh, coherent transport charging effects, quantum effects, and so on. And also some kind of semiconducting effects. But we also need this temperature for other kinds of uh, application. For, for example, uh, we, in order to be able to build high sensitivity a sensor for, uh, for instance here I put down an example, measurement of the temperature variation in the cosmic microwave background, we need to be able to go below one Kelvin. And then probably every, every one of you is aware that in order to perform a measurement uh, in quantum computing, especially with the superconducting qubits and so on, to have a, a nice experiment where thermal noise is suppressed, we need uh, to use dilution refrigerators. And in uh, this next slide, you can see three uh, examples. So probably everyone has seen one of these because this is the kind of force of, of picture you came across when you type on Google quantum computer. And this is uh, a, a dilution refrigerator for quantum computing. This is a dilution refrigerator for cryogenic quantum vector search, and what the name speaks for itself in this case. And uh, the third one is a satellite. And I listed it here because uh, dilution refrigerators are also implemented in a satellite uh, that are sent in the upper space to perform measurement at very low uh, temperature. And uh, here's a little bit of an uh, outline of what I'm going to talk 
uh, about uh, today. So first we're going to delve into the physics behind dilution refrigerators and so to meet uh, the two main characters of uh, this story which are helium-3 and helium-4 mixture. Then uh, in the second part, which is the main of this presentation, uh, I'm going to explain you about the operation of the system and then I promise that from today to the conclusion it's go I'm, I'm trying to be as short as possible and I think just uh, a few details and some uh, conclusion at the end. So let us start. Uh, as I said, uh, dilution refrigerators work with uh, mixtures of helium-3 and helium-4. But before going to that, uh, we need to uh, meet this, uh, uh, this guy here uh, first. So let us start with the cheap one, helium-4. So <laughs> helium-4 is the stable natural forming isotope of uh, helium. It, it, it consists of four nucleons, which makes him uh, a boson. And uh, for this reason, it has a total spin of uh, zero, and it obeys both the Einstein statistics. And this is a very important feature that I want you to keep in mind for later, because at 2.17 Kelvin, which is already uh, lower than the temperature of the outer space, uh, helium-4 undergoes a superfluid uh, transition. So this means that all, all the atoms of helium-3 at this temperature will find themselves in the same quantum states. And so helium-3 will turn in what is called a massive vacuum of an inert superfluid. So um, a superfluid uh, background with zero viscosity, zero specific heat, and zero entropy. And this will be essential for this here. Then this other guy here is a whole different story because it's uh, the rare expensive, very expensive, uh, as you can see, the isotope of uh, helium. This is because it's very uh, difficult to obtain and it's, obtain, it's harvested as a byproduct of the radioactive decay of tritium, which is an isotope of uh, uh, hydrogen. It is lighter than helium-4, it has a lower uh, latent heat, which means, as uh, you may have read in the information paper, as a higher vapor uh, pressure. And it is not a boson, it is a uh, fermion, so it obeys a fermion uh, statistics. But uh, now, let us go to uh, the mixture of helium-3 and helium-4. And so in this very graph here, it is hidden uh, the, phys the physics uh, key and the physics essence of uh, uh, the capability of these systems to uh, reach the range of millikelvin. So let us consider, for instance, a medium, uh, in mixtures of helium-3 in helium-4, where here we plot the temperature on the y-axis and the concentration of helium-3 on the x-axis. So let us start as a temperature of, let's say, 2.5 Kelvin, and let us cool down our system. So we overcome this line, which is called the Nanta line, which divides the superfluid phase from the normal phase. And so here, as I just said, helium-4 turns into this inert uh, superfluid. But then we keep cooling down our system until we reach uh, a point at 0 0.87 Kelvin, where we have a phase uh, separation in these mixtures. So on one side, as we can see, the concentration of helium-3 grows and grows until at the uh, zero uh, temperature, we get 100% of helium-3 in helium-3, what we can call a concentrated phase. But the very interesting thing actually takes place at the other part of the graph, because as we can see, yes, the concentration of helium-3 is lower, but it does not reach zero at, the, at uh, zero Kelvin. Indeed, we have a finite concentration of helium-3 in helium-4, namely 6.4, 6.6%, which uh, makes this uh, deal with phase. And we, we call this specific feature finite solubility. And finite solubility is what enables uh, us to reach uh, the uh, low temperature in this system, as we will see. But why we have this finite solubility? Well, I just said that helium-3 is lighter, which means it has a larger zero point uh, energy, so the atoms of helium-3, which uh, will have uh, uh, more kinetic energy than the atom of helium-4, so they will occupy a bigger volume, and so helium-3 is less dense than helium-4. But then, uh, hey, helium-3 atoms will be much happier to stay among helium-4 atoms than helium-3 atoms, because they will be in a more bounded state. And so here comes the final solubility. And the value of 6.4%, obviously not random, but it can be understood from this graph. Here we plot the chemical potential of helium-3 in helium-4 and the concentration of uh, uh, helium-3. So, uh, being L, the binding energy uh, of uh, helium-3 in pure helium-3, this is the latent heat, 
if we call uh, epsilon the binding energy of one atom of helium 3 in helium 4, we can proceed this way. So we start from the ground energy, minus epsilon, and we know that in the ground, uh, in the ground state, because uh, helium, helium 3 is a fermion, we can put two atoms with opposite speed. But then if we want to put more atoms in our system, we, we will need to obey by the principle, and so we will have to occupy the uh, higher energy levels. And uh, uh, we, have that so we have that this binding energy so is uh, lower because due to this fermionic nature until at the 0 0.064 uh, concentration of helium-3 in helium-4, we reach an equilibrium condition where the binding energy of the concentrated phase uh, is equal to the binding energy of the diluted phase. And in this condition, we will have two well-separated phase, uh, namely the um, the concentrated phase and the dilute phase, one on top of the other, because obviously the concentrated phase is lighter than the dilute phase. And now let, <laughs> let us uh, switch to the device uh, themselves. So here, here you can see uh, a scheme of a dilution uh, refrigerator, and it has uh, four main components. So the one can be pot, which I already uh, talked about in the information paper, and uh, for those who haven't read it, this is just needed to condense. Helium three. Uh, so, because we need to work with liquid helium three, and so we need this temperature, which is the temperature at uh, which helium three turns into its liquid phase. Then we have the steel here, a series of uh, heat exchangers, and then finally the mixing chamber. So, uh, a little bit of an outline of what is, uh, let's say, the flow followed by helium three in uh, these systems. And so helium three leaves uh, the one can be pot when it condenses and it enters the steel. The steel is kept at a temperature of 0 0.7 Kelvin. And also this temperature is not chemical, but it has a very specific meaning, which I will uh, uh, get to uh, in a few moments. Uh, then from the steel, helium-3 leaves, uh, leaves the steel, for instance, and uh, uh, goes into a series of heat exchanger where it's cooled uh, down. And finally, it enters the mixing chamber where you can easily see that we have these two separate phases, the concentrate phase and the liquid phase. And uh, the helium-3 enters the mixing chamber from the concentrated phase and here, the cooling power of the dilution refrigerators and also the final temperature, let us let's say, is reached. Uh, so what's happening in the mixing chamber? Well, let's assume that we are able now, I just said that helium-3 is entering here, the red line, the mixing chamber from the concentrated phase. So let us assume that we are able somehow to extract the atom of helium-3 from the dilute phase down here or uh, from the mixing chamber to the steel. If you're able to do that, then we have a, he a helium-3 atom that are uh, going away from the phase boundary. This process will uh, uh, lower the binding energy at the phase boundary, and so we are getting out of uh, equilibrium, and this means that helium-3 atom will be able to jump from the concentrated phase to uh, the dilute phase. Obviously, these jumps cost kinetic energy, so we are producing heat, Namely, we have our uh, cooling power for uh, the system. So the cooling power is given by the difference in the molar uh, entropy of helium-3 between the dilute phase and the concentrated phase. And this guy here is uh, greater than this one uh, because the specific uh, heat of helium-3 in the concentrated phase, in the dilute phase, is much higher than the specific heat uh, in, uh, in the specific in the dilute phase is much higher than the specific heat in the concentrated phase. Okay, but I say that this whole process works only uh, if we are able somehow to extract uh, atom of helium-3 from the bottom of the mixed chapter. And so, how, we, how can we do that? Well, we can do that by, as you can read here uh, in light blue, by generating a, a osmotic pressure uh, gradient from the mixing chamber uh, to uh, the steel. So, if we are able, in some sense, to generate this osmotic pressure gradient, then we will have a spontaneous flow of atom of helium-3 from the dilute phase here to uh, the steel here. And uh, I told you that a very important feature at first was this, that uh, at this temperature, helium-4 is just a superfluid uh, vacuum. So helium-3 will be able to travel through helium-4 with no interaction at all. So we can model helium-3 as a fermion, so as a system of not interactive fermions. For this reason, for the uh, osmotic pressure, we can make use of the Bantoff formula, which, which states that the 
plasmatic pressure of any moles of a substance as temperature T e in a, a solution of volume V is given by this expression. And in, in uh, this case, when we're arranging some terms and using the molar volume of uh, helium-4, we get this uh, gradient of uh, osmotic pressure. So, okay, uh, if you are able to generate this osmotic pressure gradient, then we will have our cooling power in uh, the mixing chamber. But I still haven't uh, told you how we can get the osmotic pressure gradient. Well, because this is the exact responsibility of <laughs> the steel up here. So, as you can see uh, from this picture, in the steel we mainly have dilute phase of helium-3 in helium-4. But this is not quite so. Because also from this scheme here, it is clear that the steel is directly connecting to a vacuum pumping uh, system. And this system works in the exact, in the exact same way as I explained you very naively in the information uh, paper. So what happens here is that these uh, vacuum systems keep uh, pumping on uh, the uh, liquid phase uh, here. And so by this pumping pressure, this, pump, this uh, pumping uh, 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 this pumping operation, we have that the, um, the pressure at the phase boundary between liquid and vapor is uh, lower, and so in the same way as um, we are, we can blow on a cup of hot tea to cool it down, here we will have that uh, as the pumping process goes uh, on and on, more and more uh, particles from the uh, liquid phase will jump to uh, the concentrated phase. But here comes the trick. Because, as I said, we are at a temperature of 0 0.7 Kelvin. And at this very temperature, uh, we have that the buffer pressure of helium-3 is much higher than the buffer pressure of helium-4. So when we are pumping on uh, this uh, liquid phase uh, from uh, the steel, from the dilute phase, we are not taking away atom of helium-3 and helium-4, but we are only taking away atom of helium-3 from the system. So probably now every one of you <laughs> understood why we have this osmotic pressure gradient because the concentration of helium-3 here is lower, and so we, have, uh, we will have this uh, gradient of osmotic pressure from here to here, which generate this spontaneous flow of helium-3. And why this uh, very temperature of 0.7 Kelvin? Well, the explanation is found here. Because on one side, we want the temperature to be uh, high enough for the vapor pressure of helium-3 to be as greater as possible. But the vapor pressure of helium-4 increases too with the temperature. So we cannot choose a temperature which is uh, uh, so high. And so the, let's say, optimal uh, temperature uh, in order to uh, achieve uh, the optimal flow of helium-3 to the system uh, on one side, but to block on the other the flow of helium-4, because we don't want to do that, is uh, found to be 0 0.7, 0 0.8 Kelvin. And uh, the last uh, components of dilution refrigerators, but also very important components, are the heat exchangers. The role of the heat exchanger is to cool down uh, the helium-3 uh, from the dilute phase that is coming from the steel to the mixing chamber. And uh, also the heat exchanger needs uh, to find two parameters. One is the viscosity of fluids, and one is uh, this guy here, which is the capital resistance, which is a thermal uh, resistance that goes as one over uh, the surface area uh, and the temperature to the third. So we cannot act on the temperature, but what we can do is when we can act on the surface area and maximize it as much as possible. So one way to do it is by using this continuous tube into the heat exchangers, which are not that efficient and are used at only the high temperature stage and can, uh, can reach values of 20, 40 millikelvin. And the principle is very simple. We have a tube uh, inside another tube, and the inner tube, the dilute phase is set down, and in the outer part of the tube, the concentrated phase is set up, and while it goes up, it cools down the other phase that is uh, going to the mixing chamber. But the state of the arts uh, of the um, step uh, of the of heat exchangers are these step heat exchangers which are used in series, so many heat exchangers are used in this case, and they are, uh, they are developed with the sintered metals, in this case uh, silver, to maximize the surface areas. And it, it is with this kind of uh, heat exchangers that Fossati and Al managed to reach 1.9. Uh, so a little bit of a recap, here you can see an actual uh, real device. So we have the steel here, 0 0.7 Kelvin, then we have a series of uh, continuous heat exchangers, so let's say 20 millikelvin down here, then uh, uh, as you can see a series of many uh, silver steps 
step the heat exchangers to go down to the very low temperatures range of mini Kelvin, and here the mixing chamber where the uh, cooling power is uh, achieved. And so, here an example that I show you before of a division refrigerator for quantum computing, and uh, uh, I have a question for you: Why do you think this has this specific structure? Why this stepwise structure from, let's say, the top to the bottom? Anyone want to give an idea? Let's say that I didn't mention, but the experiment is really important. Yes, that's one reason, but the main one, because, because also here we have separation of temperature, but I, uh, the main reason is to reduce vibrations. Because we want to reduce vibration as much as possible, because also this system, as I told you, are connected to, all, to vacuum pump systems, and also in, this, in the modern uh, cryogenics is usually done uh, in a dry way, uh, which means that also um, special pumping systems are used to reach uh, our initial stage of low temperature, and so by using a, by means of these uh, series of copper braids, we can uh, decouple the experiment from uh, the actual uh, vibration that happens in this uh, uh, stage here. And as, as I just mentioned it, uh, until now I've talked to you about how we need to use the one Kelvin pot at first to condense helium-3, but actually we can do uh, this in a dry way, so instead of uh, using the one Kelvin pot, we can just use a heat exchanger plus a Jal Thompson uh, valve, which uh, perform a Jal Thompson expansion, which is a specific kind of expansion that enable uh, to uh, cool down the gas that's passed uh, through uh, heat. But in this case, uh, if we are using this technology, so dry uh, refrigerator instead of wet uh, refrigerator, we need an additional vacuum uh, pump system because the condensation pressure is uh, much higher. And uh, it's one of the final things I want to convince you why um, using the Russian refrigerator and this kind of uh, physics so uh, not uh, exploiting the vapor pr uh, pressure, but uh, exploiting this finite solubility of uh, helium-3 is helium-4 is much better for uh, uh, reaching low temperature with helium-3. Because we know that the evaporative cooling, if you had the information paper, is, uh, is decreasing exponentially with the, uh, the temperature. So no matter how hard we try, there will be some limit temperature that we cannot cross, and so our cooling power is uh, uh, limited by this expression. On the other hand, the counterpart of the vapor pressure in the dilution refrigerator is the molar rate of uh, helium-3, and this is constant with temperature, and the cooling power is only limited by, as I showed you before, by the difference in molar uh, enthalpy, and that goes as uh, t squared. So in one sense, this is the normal uh, evaporation, and usually dilution refrigerators uh, is seen as an upside-down evaporation, that's why. Uh, picture. And here, to convince you even more, uh, you can see the cooling power uh, of uh, helium-3 if we use the, va the vapor pressure. So as, as you can see, it decays very, very fast as we, as we go down in temperature. While uh, the cooling power achieved with dilution refrigerator, so with finite solubility, okay, it's small, it's small, so 110 uh, microwatt, but it's much uh, higher than uh, this one. And so this is why the refrigerators are used to get to low temperature. And here I'm almost done, I promise. I just want you to show uh, an example of a company that sells this kind uh, of uh, systems. So this is a Finnish company, Blue Force, that sells dilution refrigerators. And here I took it from uh, the website. So as you can see, the, the whole framework uh, is a little bit complex. So you have yes to this, which is dilution refrigerator. Uh, so the cryogenic system, they have a control unit, uh, and a gas handling system, and also this is a liquid nitrogen uh, trapped tube because obviously uh, I have been taught to you how to get from one Kelvin down, but for me to reach one Kelvin, right? And so <laughs> for this we use uh, uh, liquid nitrogen. And here is uh, the dilution refrigerators with a uh, base temperature of correction of 10 millikelvin, which can be reached in uh, 24 hours, and on the uh, website uh, they tell you that this kind of system can work continuously for three years with no uh, maintenance. So now I will uh, conclude, and I will hope that with this uh, very, let's say, quick uh, overview of this uh, system, these five little things will remain. 
So, which are the key concepts for these operations. So we find that we have a final solubility of helium-3 and helium-4 and CO carbon, and this is what gives us the cooling power. We have two well separate phase on the top of each other, so the concentrated phase, uh, uh, which is lighter, and the field phase. This, in order to achieve this cooling power, we need to have a automatic pressure gradient that removes helium-3 from the mixing chamber. The lowest temperature is achieved by means of uh, this series of step uh, heat exchangers and the application of this system as found mainly in quantum technology and uh, space application. And thank you.